So we'd like to welcome you to today's forum. It's called Language Matters, Strengthening API Language Education at Berkeley. And I want to tell you a little bit about our organization, API Education and Languages Now. We are a student-initiated service group that emerged out of the Committee to Save East Asian Languages and Korean Studies last year. Um, since then, we have become both an official ASCC group and we have broadened our platform. Um, so we formed in late spring semester of 2008, and I sense that a good number of you are probably aware of our, our, our activities. Um, we formed in response to the proposed budget cuts to Asian languages on this campus, and we did so just a mere month or two, just to situate this for you, after the CV Star Library opened its doors. So you could say that with these cuts, proposed budget cuts to Asian languages, the library also sort of metaphorically closed its doors insofar as those very courses that would have instructed students um, um, in these languages and given them access to literacy were imperiled at that time. So I think that it's useful to give you a short organizational history. Um, basically, um, just also in reference to the library, the library is part of an overall center called the Changlin Tian Center. It's named after a former chancellor of UC Berkeley. And I think that uh, Chance uh, you know, Chancellor Tian, he had a very interesting vision for Berkeley. Um, right now, you could say that uh, if you just look around, actually, this is a campus that is 45% ethnic Asian. That w the numbers weren't quite so high during uh, Chancellor Tian's tenure, but he saw a need to have a strong, very robust Asian studies curriculum that corresponded to the rise in the ethnic Asian, Asian American student body. So what really sort of dismayed us last year, um, and this is one of the reasons why we've continued our activism on this front, is that even as the library was one feature of his legacy, what was getting cut out was his concern for curriculum building and for undergraduate and graduate student access to the very courses that would have, um, that would have signaled a sort of robust Asian studies curriculum. So basically last year what we did is we, in, we began by holding a press conference on the Berkeley campus. We then followed up with a corresponding press conference um, in Southern California. And we also um, conducted an email blast campaign, and we held um, a press, or, sorry, we, we also did a petition campaign. For that petition, we managed to garner almost 8,000 signatures, and we presented that to different administrators during the summer. We also conducted a rally just right over here, and it was interesting because the UC Berkeley p police came and started filming our activities, and they were somewhat surprised to see us because they really hadn't seen the model minority gathering in this way, carrying signs and calling out for demands with regard to their education. So, um, and the other thing that we did was we also conducted a publicity campaign. We managed to garner over 50 reports in both local mainstream um, media outlets as well as trans-Pacific papers. So um, I would just say that the need for a robust API language um, education uh, or curriculum would seem self-evident on this campus. As I mentioned, there's been a steady rise in the Asian American student population over the past decade and, and a half, and there's been a corresponding diversification of that Asian American student body. Also, Berkeley has an identity as um, a foremost public university. It's um, it, it touts itself as the flagship campus of, a U, of the UC system, which really understands itself to be a major Pacific Rim institution. And so this forum is uh, partly for us to sort of renew Berkeley's pledge and its commitment to its student body, as well as to lo local Bay Area communities um, from, whom, uh, from which uh, many of these students are drawn. And so uh, with the realization that the current sort of budget woes can dampen institutional vision, we saw the necessity of calling a forum where faculty, administrators, lecturers, students, 
and community members could all come together in common cause and form a concrete plan of action uh, with regard to API language education. So this forum is explicitly intended to uh, build bridges basically to create an across-the-board initiative to strengthen API language education on this campus. And we are very, very heartened by the support that we've received. So very briefly, I want to thank all of the people who agreed to sponsor this event, including the Vice Chancellor's Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Asian American Studies Program, the Center for Race and Gender, the Institute of East Asian Studies, the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, the Center for South Asia Studies, the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, the Department of Comparative Literature, Asian Pacific American Student Development Office, APOSDI, um, Asian Pacific American Coalition, the Townsend Center Working Group on Asian Cultural Studies, Filipinos for Affirmative Action, the Korean Community Center of the East Bay, and Chinese for Affirmative Action. So um, we're extraordinarily heartened by the support, uh, whereas we felt like we were working to some degree in isolation last year. The sponsorship of this event is evidence of the kind of cross-campus support that this issue um, has uh, generated. So um, I would just say a couple of things. Um, we're going to, maybe I'll save this for later, but. Um, Actually, let me go ahead and say this now. It seems like when we were talking to people last year, I just want to say that it seemed like a number of people, institutional figures, were very acutely aware of what the problem was, but not necessarily moved to action. And then there are also figures like language lecturers who were who weren't exactly structurally empowered to advocate um, on this issue. And then there were individual groups fighting for different languages. Um, sort of discrete struggles. And so we really wanted to bring all of these people together so that we could have dialogue here on, on, on API language education. The core problem at the heart of this, um, the curricular instability, what we saw last year with the proposed downsizing of Asian language education that would have decimated some programs and halved programs like Chinese and Japanese, um, this curricular instability is really tied fundamentally to the lack of labor security for lecturers, and their salaries are tied to temporary academic staffing uh, funding, so to task funding. So there's this issue, and there's also a kind of budgetary calculus, and we'd like to discuss this today, that ties funding to the number of minors, majors, and number of graduate students. And so, um, in many instances, language education is deemed service education, and it's accorded less budget priority. And so, and, and so that's one problem. And so as we saw last year with the proposed budget cuts, students from colleges outside of letters and sciences and heritage learners of these langu languages were denied access to these languages. Of course, this was reversed, but it's a sign of who won't get access if the budget cuts are severe. So, and the other sort of problem that we saw is that minor API languages like Tagalog, Thai, Korean, um, they never seem to be assured of sufficient funding. And so these are some things that we'd like to discuss. And at the end of this um, event, we're going to have breakout sessions and we plan to actually, we plan to form a task force. And our task force, if you look in your, um, if you look in your program, on the second page, you'll see our task force mission statement. So just in brief, the task force will comprise one-third faculty, one-third students, and one-third community members. And our goals are as follows. The first is to promote university recognition of API languages, not only as living local languages, both on and off this campus, um, particularly in light of the sort of shifting curricular needs of, of the student body, but also as global languages. And so these are the sorts of things that actually got cut out last year with the sort of uh, reduction in heritage access or the elimination of heritage access, at least temporarily, and the sort of, uh, the sort of uh, limitation of access of people, outside, of students outside of letters and science, both 
API languages as living local languages and as global languages, that sort of recognition didn't actually seem to be there. Um, the second goal is to push for the creation of minors, majors, and programs of graduate study in API languages and area studies with adequate and fair budgetary support across the board, with particular attention to languages that have been historically marginalized within the Asian studies curriculum on this campus. And uh, last but certainly not least, the establishment of job security for instructors of API languages and education. So those, uh, in brief, are the goals of our task force. That task force is currently being formed. We welcome your input and your participation and your feedback on that. And so, Sarah. All right, so that was a lot of information we know. but. Um, in light of what Christine said, first of all, we want to thank you all for being here, taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, now, let's start with the first question that compels us to be here in the first place. Why are we here? I would say it's to communicate. And we say that we communicate every day, but if we were to impose a definition that I consider as communication, we wouldn't be. Because what communication is, is not only to talk to each other and to hear each other out, but to strive to understand and also to understand that what, one, what affects one person also affects all of us as a whole. So with this in mind, this forum is a space where you, I, and everyone in here can not only explain, but also gain insight in the current situation and how other people perceive the situation. Um, so we intend to bring together students, community members, faculty and staff, and everyone else to understand through communication and thus propel us into action so that we may be able to establish a permanent structure of support for API language education here at Berkeley, which affects not just us at this school, but also in our community, in our nation, and in, in this world. So with that said, um, I want to invite the student speakers up now. So as they're coming up, let me introduce them to you really quick. First we have Julia Lam. Julia Lam is a fourth year undergraduate, double majoring currently in molecular cell biology and Chinese. She volunteers at a local hospital as an interpreter. Second we have Mary June Flores, who is a third year undergraduate, double majoring in Asian American studies and ethnic studies and minoring in global poverty and practice. She's currently an ASUC senator and is also an intern for Asian Pacific American Student Development and Multicultural Center. Here we have Ben Likely. Um, ben Likely is a second year graduate student in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science program. Also, he is minoring in, the, in Korean. And lastly, we have Jeff Shea, who is a fifth year undergraduate, double majoring in Chinese and Japanese and minoring in Korean. Let's give them a hand. Hello. Oh, hi. Um, my name's Julia. I'm a fourth year um, MCV and um, MCV major in Chinese language minor. And so I'm here to talk about my work with um, our student initiated group here on campus called the San Francisco Hepatitis B Collaborative. And what we do is that we're a group here on campus that we recruit students from our campus and we bring them and um, they're API language speakers and we bring them to uh, free hepatitis B screening and vaccination clinics in San Francisco. And that's not the only place that we work at. We also get invited to work at uh, plenty of street fairs and health fairs where they put on plenty of other health, um, health checks for community members. And so I guess my work started in uh, my sophomore year, with the group started sophomore year, and at the same time, I also started uh, my Chinese language learning here at Berkeley. So uh, since then, I've really felt that my work with the, uh, with the community and my language learning have really gone hand in hand. Um, two years ago, I didn't speak an ounce of Mandarin, but now I am able to um, give full-scale community outreach presentations on hepatitis B to, to whoever will, or whoever are uh, willing to listen to me. So, and that's the case for a lot of my um, club members as well. A lot of them have taken and are still taking 
language classes here at Berkeley, and these are also include um, Chinese classes, Korean and Vietnamese classes. So, so why are we, why are so many of our members um, taking these classes? And one of the main reasons is because we want to be able to one day uh, return to these communities. Many, many of them, um, like I said, maybe what they're, like I said, they're heritage speakers. So many of them, they want to go back to the communities to do work in their communities. And some of these communities, these API communities, are, they're some of the, um, these communities, uh, they have the highest incidence of hepatitis B, and they're actually victims of, you know, some of the largest, like, health disparities. And I think one of the main reasons why this is is because of these language barriers that, you know, they're there. Because of these barriers, a lot of these um, community members, they're not receiving, you know, the right services, they're not receiving healthcare information, and they're just misinformed in many areas. And so part of our work is so that we, part of our work is to serve as liaisons uh, currently between community members and healthcare providers to help them bring down these, these barriers. And so we've done a lot of work now um, in these clinics, but we've also, we've, we've developed a lot of materials for community members in language materials. And even just recently, we've been asked by um, the SF Head Be Free campaign. This is the citywide campaign in San Francisco to, to help um, educate and to eradicate hepatitis B in the API community. So we've been asked recently, our group, our Berkeley group, have been asked to, to form a subcommittee, subcommittee of the campaign to do, um, to do in-language publicity. And so to have an entire subcommittee devoted to in-language publicity, that goes to show you how important in-language publicity is, because these are the people that we want to reach, and we can't do that without in-language publicity. So we've been asked to do that, and that really is a big, really big responsibility, but um, that's something that, that we're willing to take on. And so I guess all the work that we've been doing really is proof that really is proof that our in-classroom learning, it really is um, transferable and directly uh, applicable to, to work in the community. And so I think as a university um, like Berkeley perched at the center of all this, at the epicenter of all these um, diverse and growing API community groups, I think we really do have a responsibility to, um, to be aware and to be sensitive of the needs of our, of our community. And part of that is, is to recognize that um, these API languages, they're living languages, and that people all around here that speak these languages need, need our help. And so what the university, I think, can do is to, to, not, to, to not discourage students from taking these classes, but really to encourage them to take API language classes. Because so that, you know, so that our university can turn out students that can go work in these communities to serve these communities and hopefully to better these communities for the future. Um, yeah, so really what we've been doing really we haven't been getting too much funding for our group. That's something hoping we're hoping to get. But what we're really hoping for, our group especially, is um, for support from the university um, to continue doing the work that we're doing. And part of that, or part of what the university can do, is to recognize that API language learning is important. Um, and that they should not marginalize API language classes, but the university really should be um, believing they should have faith that these language classes are, are worth it, they're worth our, our time, our money, and our resources, because really they are. And that's really because these, these API, learning, API classes, they're not just a service to our students here on campus, but they're a service to, to also the people in our, in our community here. Yeah, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Mary June Flores again, and I'm just gonna speak um, as a student who, have, who has taken a Tagalog course here on campus. The Tagalog language courses are offered in a different department in the South Southeast Asian Studies Department. And in the past year, we've actually suffered through a cut. Um, there used to be two introductory courses that were 
offered in that department. Now there's only one introductory class, um, and also we have one intermediate class for Tagalog. And I'm just gonna speak on behalf of the Filipino American student community here on campus. Um, there are 3% um, that translate into 900 students. Um, 900 students who are deeply affected by their identity as Filipino slash Filipino Americans and not having enough Tagalog courses to be able to um, host these students is really detrimental in terms of their cultural retention and also the way in which they can learn about their um, native language and also how they can go back to the communities. Um, so just a history on Tagalog classes here. The Tagalog classes here actually started out as a, a decal, a decal meaning democratic style teaching that students actually started 17 years ago. And so from that, um, you can already tell that 17 years ago, students back then were really already seeing the importance in having Tagalog classes as a really important language course here on campus. So these students initiated um, willing to teach each teach each other Tagalog um, Tagalog because they saw the importance and the relevance of knowing um, Tagalog as a language. And so it started out as a decal and then it became to be taught um, as a class in the department. And just last year, our lecturer, who actually taught the class for 16 years, um, retired. And so not only were we um, suffering for from a reduction of classes, we also we also um, lacked um, a permanent or at least a lecturer who will be able to teach Tagalog cl courses this year. And fortunately, in the summer, um, we found a lecturer who could teach the Tagalog classes here on campus. But tying that into the faculty and faculty and lecturer employment security, um, right now we're still in in the process of gaining a permanent, or gaining towards a permanent lecture for Tagalog. And right now you see the vulnerability of the lecturer not being able to teach again next year as more budget cuts um, come, ar come, arise, come to rise. And so with that said, um, taking Tagalog two years ago as a freshman, um, really helped me to remember my language. I came here to the United States 10 years ago, um, old enough to remember the Philippines, but um, old enough to also embrace the United States as my new country. And so my Tagalog was very broken, and um, to this day, I tend to forget some Tagalog words. And just bearing that in mind really shows you how there's a need to sustain these API languages and these courses, not just API languages, but also education, um, API literature classes, history classes that will really um, educate not only those students who are affected by it culturally, but non-heritage students. Um, and also, so this summer I interned for Filipinos for Affirmative Action and one of the tasks that I worked on was a domestic workers project um, within FAA. And one of the biggest barriers that we face uh, trying to organize, to grassroots organize with, with the community members is the language barrier. A lot of them are immigrants moving from the Philippines to the Bay Area and so the only real way in which they can communicate is through language, which would be Tagalog. So for me to be able to practice my Tagalog skills in the past, during the during the summer, from what I've learned taking the Tagalog course two years ago, really helped me see the connection between what we learn in the university and also how we can practice it outside this university. And so this domestic workers project is actually going to be the first steps in which policies can be made to safeguard domestic workers, also um, domestic immigrant workers. Uh, in the Bay Area, and also in California, largely. And that is pretty much it, and I just wanted to really um, emphasize that all of these things that we're learning in the university are inextricably tied to the rest responsibility of the university as a public university to the communities external to the universities. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, um, my name is uh, Ben Likely, and I'm a second year EECS graduate student here. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my experience with the Korean program. So two years ago when I was applying to graduate school, uh, one of the features that really set Berkeley apart from the other schools that I was looking at was its awesome Korean program. And that is really one of the key reasons why I chose to come here over other top schools. And I, I can really attest to its quality because I've improved so much in the past two years since I've been here. But um, the problem is that when these type of budget crises arise, these programs end up being the first to get cut and the cuts get propagated along departmental lines. So students who aren't majoring in these languages or who may not be in the College of Letters and Sciences, they're the first students to get deprioritized and cut from the classes. So no matter how important it is to their career, their development, their education, they're the first to get dropped. And this is exactly what happened last spring um, when the students who weren't in the College of Letter of Sciences were at one point not allowed to enroll in uh, the Korean programs. So, so since I was concerned about this, I, I went to one of my deans, one of the engineering deans, and, and asked her what she could do to help me about this. And basically what she said was that there was nothing that she could do, and that since I wasn't majoring in Korean, that I would just have to find some other way, and that if I had to minor in some other subject, then that would have to be it. And at the time, I thought that this was a really lousy solution. Um, but as I thought about it, I, I think that one of the key problems is that even though the students here have very cross-disciplinary interests, um, the kind of the hierarchy of the UC and the way it's set up can end up hampering these, these kind of cooperations. And I think that this is kind of the, the key problem that I would like to see changed. Um, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Xie. I'm a, uh, in my ninth semester here at Berkeley and a double major in Chinese, Japanese, and a minor in Korean. Um, I'm just gonna read more from my script. Uh, most, if not all, students love to learn languages. Students love to go abroad and to meet new people, to explore exotic lands, to expand their worldviews, to learn more about themselves and their values, to understand the role of, and importance of languages in their lives. Everyone who has learned a foreign language agrees that language opens up new doors and opportunities. However, students don't often realize what language can mean for them. Language can open up uh, their, the realms of their minds. It can add to their completeness. And I attended a conference last, uh, last week or two weeks ago where the notion was um, raised that people understand how incomplete they are once they learn a new language. They realize how much is missing from their lives uh, once, they see, once their worldviews are expanded beyond their native tongue. But there's a prevalent view that lang of language that is very utilitarian, and I think the blame for this can be placed on uh, universities and the archaic notion that language study leads only to literature research. Although literature is an important co component of language and cultural education, it has eclipsed the role of language in the undergraduate curriculum, instead boasting itself to be the true field of academic study. Ma major and minor programs for foreign languages consist of mostly literature courses, with language courses being just prerequisites to be sort of trudged through, um, and linguistics courses are often reduced to only electives. This kind of curriculum sends a very obvious overt message to students majoring in foreign languages that language is no more than a tool for the ultimate purpose of a obtaining a master's or a PhD in literature. This message, I would say, scares away many students who are interested in studying language, but whose life goals are not necessarily oriented around a life of writing and studying books and translation. Many students would rather become proficient in a language and learn how to apply it in a field like business, political science, medicine, etc. That's why in the language departments, you get such a high rate of people who double major in a language and then a different field of study. Students and their parents realize the impracticality of pursuing a, lit a literature track language program, and so those who are able to pursue another major in hopes that someday down the line, they'll be able to figure out some way to consolidate these two seemingly different fields of study. I consider this lack of integration between language and, academic, and, and other academic fields a travesty since language is perhaps the only field of study that has the potential to span every other field of study. 
Now, I'm not saying that I don't like literature. I love literature and my literature professors too. But I, I'm a Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. I study Chinese, Japanese, and Korean here. But I don't think that I'll be going into a PhD track into literature. Uh, I'm, my honors thesis right now is currently in linguistics and second language acquisition. So I'd say that there's other students out there who are like me and who don't necessarily want to pursue this track of literature. Um, last April, though, we saw the university's institutional calculus in the initial budget cut pr proposal handed down to the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Uh, the powers that be compared the number of Chinese, Japanese majors, and Chinese, Japanese, Korean minors to the number of students enrolled in these classes and decided that the ratio uh, merited a significant cut. Their priority was to first preserve majors and minors, then graduate students, and lastly, everyone else to whom they considered these classes, again, service courses. The university disregarded the needs of students seeking to gain proficiency in their heritage languages and students seeking to enrich their academic studies with a foreign language. They entertained this kind of misguided notion that language education is ultimately a tool for the use of literature study and that students in other majors do not need this kind of tool and service education. Another institutional problem that I think is related to this is uh, the precarious situation of language lecturers. Again, in the ELC department, the salaries of almost 30 language lecturers are tied to a temporary academic uh, staff budget, which is in itself tied to the very volatile state budget. We see that from this, the university, uh, and the, the university does not uh, regard language lectures in the same light as literature professors. Uh, the work of these lectures is disregarded, as are their PhDs and their uh, master's degrees, uh, their years of experience in teaching language, their papers and research into language pedagogy and teaching methodology, all of this is discounted by the university. This sends a message to students studying language that teaching these languages is not important and is not merit, does not merit research. Perhaps this is due to Berkeley's lack of commitment to producing language teachers as well, though. The School of Education does not offer credentials or a program for students interested in learning about second language pedagogy. And uh, again, this sends the message that the university does not value this kind of research. And this message, in turn, translates into a disparaging view of language lectures and their work, which leads into this vicious cycle of language lectures always being at the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, this is a reality that we must get out of because in this time uh, when, our, when the U.S. is uh, rapidly was trying to regain its foothold in the, in, as a world leader, teachers of foreign languages are in ever-increasing need uh, to build up a multicultural, a transcultural, multilingual, and a translingual America. Thank you. Briefly, we have a change in the schedule because, uh, no, Andrew, Fiona Ma. Yes, we're going to have Fiona Ma right now. Okay, I anticipated that, okay. There's a change in schedule. Fiona Ma um, has another appointment after this, so she will go ahead and uh, speak right now. But what I wanted to say too is just um, to follow up on those wonderful student testimonials, we have collected um, a selective sampling, we, or we presented a selective sample, sampling of student testimonials on the last two pages of your program. So please do check those out when you have the time. And Sarah will introduce Assemblywoman Fiona Ma. All right, um, welcome. <laughs> well, Fiona Ma, who is she? She is an Assemblywoman representing California's 12th Assembly District, which includes San Francisco, Daly City, Colma, and Broad Broadmoor. A former San Francisco supervisor, Assemblywoman Ma is Assembly Major Majority Whip and also serves on several key committees, including ap Appropriations, Health, Revenue, and Taxation, and Public Safety. She is also the chair of the Assembly Select Committee on Domestic Violence. Thank you, and let's give her a hand. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I was asked to come here today just to talk a little bit about uh, politics and what the landscape uh, is in San Fran uh, in is in California. Um, 
I myself am the daughter of immigrants. Uh, my parents wanted me to go into an honorable profession. Uh, so uh, they decided early on that I should be an accountant. So I am a CPA uh, by training. Um, and being in politics is really my second career. Uh, it's something that I fell into, but something I believe is very important, that we need to be at the table. Uh, this country is about democracy, it's about representation, and it's about the voices that are heard. And the more that we are at the table with our voices heard, the more power we are going to get. And you being here today talking about language and the importance of language programs is important for all of us to hear. Um, as a daughter of immigrants uh, representing the most Asian district in the state, uh, I understand how important it is that we are able to communicate uh, to our constituents so that they can access uh, the programs and the services and also all of the other um, uh, available programs that you are all offering here uh, at Berkeley. And so I would encourage you to lobby, uh, come up to Sacramento and lobby during those lobby days and talk to the legislators about the importance of these programs, what they mean to you, uh, how they are going to impact your community and uh, the future generations, because that's what it's about. It's about the squeaky wheel. Uh, making sure that you keep your priorities at the top means you have to let us know that it is important to the community. Uh, so uh, this early this morning at 7 a.m., we passed a $40 billion budget. Uh, it was not um, a happy budget. Uh, nobody is happy uh, with it. Uh, it has uh, revenues. Um, but it also has a severe amount of cuts uh, to many programs, especially in the uh, public education sector, uh, since public education is 50% of our budget. So when we have hard times, um, the education community also feels the impact of budget cuts. Um, but we are doing what we can to try to protect as many of the programs, uh, make sure we uh, fully fund Proposition 98, uh, which is our minimum guarantee for our schools. Uh, but a lot of the programs that are extra programs, such as language programs, don't always get uh, preserved uh, during these tough times. And so it is important that when we uh, do um, face better financial uh, times that we put back these programs, the programs are, that are important to many people that are impacted. And so I would encourage you to come up to Sacramento and lobby us. Uh, Right now, um, 37 million people in California, about 12% are APIs. And we are doing pretty good in terms of representation. Uh, we have 11 Asian members uh, in our legislature, which is pretty good. And I have a list of the members uh, in the back. Um, I represent San Francisco. Ted Liu, Assemblyman, represents Los Angeles. Uh, Assemblywoman Mary Hayashi, the first Korean American, represents Alameda County. Paul Fong, uh, newly elected, represents Santa Clara County. Mariko Yamada represents Solano and Yolo counties. Uh, Mike Eng, uh, assembly member representing Los Angeles County. Warren Furutani also representing Los Angeles. And assembly member Alberto Tarico represents Alameda and Santa Clara County. So these are uh, my colleagues uh, in the assembly as well as the one Republican. Uh, Van Tran, who represents Orange County. Uh, we have two senators, uh, Senator Leland Yee, also from San Francisco, and Senator Carol Liu just got elected representing Los Angeles. And we're very lucky because we have a statewide constitutional officer. He is the highest ranked Asian American elected official in the United States, and that is John Chung. Uh, the state controller. You probably heard of John Chung as he is uh, battling, uh, was battling the governor in terms of furloughs and, and other cuts. Uh, we also have three members of the State Board of Equalization. I think people uh, believe that Asians are good with money, uh, so they like to elect um, Asians to uh, those money type of uh, positions. Uh, Judy Chu, uh, represents Los Angeles County. She is running for Congress uh, to replace Hilda Solis if Hilda Solis um, gets appointed. Uh, Board of Equalization member Betty Yee. Uh, she represents uh, this uh, Northern California region. 
and also board member Michelle Steele represents Imperial, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, Los Angeles uh, counties. And so we have quite a good representation of Asian uh, representatives and I would encourage you to uh, get to know them, um, to use us as your voice in government um, and um, you know, um, get to know us because we understand uh, the importance of uh, Asian languages and how they impact and to make sure that we also uh, are, are um, accessible to as many uh, people that we can knowing um, that Asian is not, um, that English is not uh, our first language in uh, many of our households. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to seeing you in San Francisco or in Sacramento or around the Bay Area. So thank you for your advocacy here. been another slight shift in schedule. Katie Joaquin has not arrived. She's stuck in traffic, um, the sort of bearish traffic from San Jose, but she is on her way and will be here shortly. So we're actually going to move ahead to the next panel, which is the faculty and the administrative panel. And Sarah, would you like to do the introduction? Okay. So if you could come up and also away. Okay, so we have up here Elaine Kim and Gabor Basri. Elaine Kim is a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She is a former acting associate dean of the graduate division, former chair of the Comparative Ethnic Studies Department, former faculty assistant for the status of women, and former assistant dean of the College of Letters and Science at UC Berkeley. Here we have Gabor Basri, who is a professor of astronomy at the U UC Berkeley and serves as the university's first vice chancellor for equity and inclusion. He is a former acting chair of the astronomy department and a board member of the Chabot Space and Science Center and the I Have a Dream Oakland Foundation. Let's give him a hand and have him talk to us. Hi, I was born in the US to a second generation mom who didn't speak Korean well, so throughout my life, I tried to learn Korean. And since I grew up on the East Coast, there were, there were no community language schools, and of course there were no Korean language classes in my high school or at the University of Pennsylvania where I went to college. And so the first time t chance I had to learn to study Korean was when I was a graduate student at Columbia, and that's where I learned how to say, this is a pen and that is a pencil. <laughs> so I was really eager to learn more Korean than that. So I took a, a, year, a year and a half off from school and went to live in Korea, which was really difficult in the 1960s because it was a big adjustment because uh, Korea, Korea is very, was, um, the distance uh, in terms of transportation and communication between Korea and the US in the 1960s was immense compared to now. And also the economic distance between the US and Korea was also immense. And so I learned some conversational Korean and when I came back uh, to the US and came to Berkeley, I thought it was, I, I was really anxious to continue studying Korean. But the only course, <laughs> the courses I found here, there were two classes, and one of them, we spent the whole semester studying a few pages of an 11th century Buddhist scripture. And the other was um, where we spent the whole semester studying a few pages of a short story, contemporary, kind of, well, 50-year-old short story called Potato. <laughs> and um, and the, the guy who was teaching that class was a visiting person who, who was doing a translation of that into English and he wanted the native speaking students, and we were only three students in that class, to help render it into fluent English. Oh, so terrible. And so I thought, well, I'll try going to the Defense Language Institute, because at that time the Defense Language Institute was a place that you, um, uh, you, UC graduate students could go and take a class. So I was more advanced than their um, military 
um, they had these introductory Korean classes for the military, but I was more advanced than that, so I got to study for a summer, um, uh, sort of tutored by different uh, teachers there. Anyway, I tried and tr I tried everything. I tried hiring a tutor. I tried going to the Korean Community Center every day, and finally, in 1980, I gave up because I realized that to become fluent like a native, I would actually have to speak Korean three hours a day with somebody who didn't speak English. Otherwise, I wasn't going to be able to do it. And so I am so shocked that almost 30 years later, even in light of the demographic changes at the UC campus and in global realities, that we've made so little progress in terms of language education at Berkeley. For me, language education experiences so far have had a lot to do with cultural inequality. And, um, and by that I mean basically Eurocentrism in US language education. And when I was a graduate student in English here at Berkeley, I used my name, you know, which is Korean, uh, on my exam. And, and somebody who, who read my, you know, all of us had to take um, three reading exams, German, I took German, French, and Latin, but I was very good in Latin because I t took four years of high school Latin and I placed in the national Latin exam. But the person who read my exam wrote on the exam, this person has mastered the mechanics of syntax and grammar but does not understand the basic tenets of Judeo-Christian civilization. And I thought, that's impossible because I don't know any other tenets. You know, I actually grew up here and went K through 12 in the United States. And uh, so I thought that that person looked at my name and figured that was a thing to say because, you know, Asian people, they're sort of mimetic. They just, they don't really understand the concept. They just copy and then make a car or make a computer or whatever. And then I wanted to write my dissertation in the English department on Asian American literature, but I was not uh, able, and I was not permitted to do that. So I thought I'll try to transfer to comparative literature. But I had taken... German, French, and Latin, and they told me that if I was going to continue in comp lit for a PhD to write a dissertation in Asian American literature, I'd have to take Spanish or Portuguese and uh, Greek. So that means that our comparative literature department was not a comparative literature department, it was an European literature department called comparative literature. And at the same time, I was also a TA for a remedial English class um, called Subject A back then. <laughs> and during that time, they viewed um, bilingualism as a detriment to English education. And they, they, they openly said that the problem that Asian American students had was that they were, there were too many bilingual students. And I would also like to add that the SAT exam in languages, you know, it, it would not allow a person, let's say you were a Vietnamese immigrant student and you had to learn English as your second language, and you, and, but, but you couldn't count English as a language and you couldn't count Vietnamese as a language, so you'd have to learn like German and French or Spanish as your languages. It was very Eurocentric. And at the same time, when I was working in the chancellor's office, there was a big complaint from one of our campus departments that one of the professors, who's a native speaker of Chinese, and was hosting postdoctoral um, uh, scholars in, in that science department, was speaking Chinese to those scholars. And the chair came to the chancellor's office to complain about that and said that, you know, uh, there have been complaints that this professor is speaking Chinese. You know, we have a person who's German and he doesn't speak German. You know, so why does this person speak Chinese? And she was arguing that these people came to study that scientific um, subject that I won't name the department. Um, they did not come to study English and they did not come to study language. So it was not a class, it was not a lecture, it was nothing like that. She was just talking to them about that subject in the language uh, that they could best understand. <clears throat> and, but, the, but the department was up in arms about it and wanted her to speak English to these scholars. And so the, the matter went to our chancellor, who was then Chancellor Tian, who's of course very fluent in Chinese. And Chancellor Tian said, well, I think that it's fabulous that, uh, that many languages are spoken in every place on our campus, on every plaza, in every room. So I think it's really uh, positive rather than negative. So she didn't get chastised. 
<clears throat> and then I, I also want to mention that I did also hear when I was working um, in the administration and interviewing about the education abroad program applicants, I heard faculty say that uh, it was really terrible that heritage students were taking all these EAP, were going to these EAP, the education abroad programs, instead of really, you know, it would be really great if non-heritage students would go there. And I thought that was extremely racist because um, what, what was wrong with heritage students going to the, uh, to the uh, a country of origin? It did not necessarily mean that they weren't serious about that language or that subject or learning about that, that country. But in some way, it was as if uh, they were not bona fide students if, if they were going to the, their country of origin. And also, I thought there was a view that native speakers are just technicians. You know, um, they sort of translate the captions or something, but they don't really understand the content or the philosophy. And as well, a hierarchy among languages that not only put, at that time, European languages above other languages, but also a hierarchy among languages so that um, Chinese and Japanese were ever more important than any of the other Asian languages. I also agree with Jeff Shea that the idea of language education as service needs to be interrogated. Because in liberal education, not all courses are taken for your major. You're supposed to have a broad education. Not all courses are directly uh, for your career. From language study, I learned about history, politics, anthropology, literature, and culture. And I learned uh, how different people think. I learned about Confuci Confucianism, uh, or helped me understand Confucianism to study Korean and the way uh, uh, address people are addressed in different ways. The second thing is, I think that um, the university, back then and now, would benefit from taking advantage of its um, possible connections with local living communities. And languages could be, a, as, as the students mentioned, a key to that. The third thing is that uh, we have to have education for 21st century global realities. We need to, it, it was amazing that um, uh, when we, uh, after we declared war on Iraq, it was discovered that we hardly have anybody who speaks Arabic in the United States. That's a kind of a travesty. Um, again, and the fourth thing is I think we need to pay attention to the importance of the contemporary. It's really old fashioned to say that the only legitimate way to study Korean is an 11th century Buddhist uh, scripture. We have to, um, to throw away forever the idea that all things contemporary are less important and less, uh, less, less um, uh, bona fide than things that are ancient. That's not necessarily true. Fifth, I think that we need to, um, to open ourselves to interdisciplinarity. As Jeff Shea said, language is not just for literary studies and not just for national defense. It's a, we can study, we can put together um, majors that have to do that have language in them, history, politics, anthropology, all kinds of interdisciplinary connections, and make make that into um, majors that uh, that don't only lead uh, to literary higher higher um, upper division literary studies or national defense studies. Finally, I'd like to say I really do think that student activism is very effective. And student demands, you know, when students want certain kinds of courses, then eventually those courses do appear. And the courses they don't want sort of recede into the background, you've, as we have seen. And so it's, it is very important for students not to get discouraged um, from their activism, because in the end, I think, um, they will really precipitate big changes in language education. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Kim for uh, providing an excellent segue into what I was planning to say. In fact, she's sort of said half of it already. Uh, but I'll, I'll reiterate it because it's, it's well worth saying. Uh, so I'm, I'm in a new position on campus, the Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion. Uh, and we've 
been thinking for about a year about what does this mean exactly? Uh, since it's a new division, uh, nobody knew quite what it does, including, including myself and the other people in the division. So we've been thinking hard about that. Uh, and we're, we're, we will come out uh, in more detail with a, with a strategic plan later this semester. But I think this symposium really uh, encapsulates many of the issues that we, we want to take on and, and things that the university uh, would like to move on. Uh, really, al almost everything that's been said by both the student panel and, and Assemblywoman Ma and, and Elaine Kim is kind of inarguable. Uh, it's, I don't think anyone is disputing most of those facts and most of those analyses. Uh, you know, so how, why, is it, why, why is it that we have this problem? We have to remember that uh, this university is, it is one of, the, one of the finest or the finest public universities in the nation or maybe even in the world, uh, but it has a history. You know, it came, came from somewhere. It didn't look like this 50, 60 years ago. It would be very, this, this symposium would not have taken place. 50 years ago, uh, things change. And that was part of, uh, part of what Dr. Kim was talking about. Uh, things are evolving. The, the people who are here are different. The state is different. This is a public university, and its charter tells it that it is here to serve the people of the state. It wasn't serving the people of the state at, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, in particular, the, you know, the Asian population in California was, uh, was completely excluded at the beginning of the 20th century from, from almost everything, and that has only changed slowly over time. Uh, other populations were also excluded from the university uh, half a century ago. So now we are in a different place. Uh, not that everyone is, is here fully, but uh, we're certainly in a much different place than we were before. Uh, and the problem with academia is it's, it's very uh, progressive in some senses. It, it you know, encourages uh, cutting edge thinking and innovation and so on. And in other senses, it's very conservative. So you have people uh, who are, especially the faculty, who are here for a long time uh, and who have colleagues that they've had for a long time and have ways of doing things that were really cutting edge when they started. Uh, and they try to keep moving that forward, but the world changes around them and, and the faculty does not turn over kind of at the same rate as the world does. And so, so we find ourselves in a, in a university which is always in some senses ahead of the curve and in other senses behind the curve. Uh, so in particular, this, this issue about Asian languages and the Asian population at the university you know, is one where there, there needs to be some catch up. Uh, the student body has changed quite a bit with respect to its Asian composition over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the professoriate, not so much. And as, as Elaine was, was talking about, the question about what people do research on uh, is one which has a tendency to change somewhat more slowly than, than outside forces. Um, so that doesn't mean that we should fire the faculty and start over. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. What it does mean, though, is that as departments think about where they want to go for the future, they, they need a, a better process for thinking about how the world has changed and where, where they could best serve the public interest, uh, because this is a public university. Uh, so part of our strategic plan is centered around the concept of responsive research, teaching, and public service. And by that we mean responsive to the public mission of the university. Uh, so when you have a student body which has a lot of Asian students in it, you have a university situated on the Pacific Rim, uh, you have a state which wants to participate in that economy, and so on, there are a number of conditions which have, have changed. Uh, being responsive means that we have to think harder about how we, how we do business here, uh, where, which areas we want to expand into, which areas we want to let, um, uh, you know, die a natural death because they, they aren't quite as relevant. Uh, this is something that you can just try to just let it happen or you can be more intentional about it. And so one of the things that the Division of Equity and Inclusion is going to try to ask the campus is to just think about the future and the changing world and try to write down, you know, what, what is the plan for each department unit and whatever. Uh, what is the plan to uh, sort of adapt to those changes or lead them even, even better? 
um, and actually be in intentional enough about it that you know they, they could write it down. Departments have academic plans. The academic plans tend, though, to perpetuate the, the current departments. And so we just have to be more mindful of that, that tendency and look, look more towards the future about that. Uh, the second part of, of the um, strategic plan talks about um, access and, uh, and pathways to success. Uh, and there again, uh, we have to think about who's here now and what their aspirations and pathways are going to be and how the university can, can best um, allow them to succeed because it's really our, our mission and our purpose and our, our reason for being uh, to educate the people of California for the world of the future and also for, uh, for all of us to work together on the ideas that make California the most effective state it can be. And that very much includes the question of how, do, how does a very multicultural collection of people uh, operate in an optimal way? How do they cooperate with each other? How do they learn from each other? How do they have synergies with each other? How do they understand each other? And all of these, these issues, uh, the university ought to be a leader in this area and not, not holding back any progress. So that's another, another area. The final area is, is about uh, climate uh, and inclusiveness and whether people feel like they belong, whether they feel like their needs are being met, whether they feel like uh, uh, they're being understood. Uh, and again, uh, we just have to think about, as we have new sets of people with new sets of concerns and new ideas, uh, what are we doing to make them feel included and what is it that we do that may unintentionally make them feel not so included. Uh, so those are the, the three areas that we think the, the, my division uh, has to think about. And this issue about Asian languages is, you know, it's a great example of all those areas uh, coming into play. So uh, we've heard about, uh, you know, things that happen when budgets get cut. And we, we know and we heard from Assemblywoman Ma just now that, uh, you know, there, there is at least a new budget, which wasn't true until this morning, uh, but that it certainly involves a lot of cuts. Um, and, and I hope that you, you understand that the university administration, uh, you know, doesn't try to, try to get cut or, you know, like the idea of cutting things. So, so in, the, in the better world, uh, we wouldn't actually even have to make decisions about where cuts go. Um, and, and those are always going to be painful. And as we think about those decisions, uh, you know, my, my hope is that we will take into account the three areas that, I, that I'm talking about, that I talked about before, uh, when deciding how to make those cuts. But make no mistake, uh, cuts will come and cuts will be painful. So th that's the only way around that is uh, for us to work against those cuts in the, at the end of the day. So part of my message to you is, you know, where do the cuts come from? Well, they, they come from the state and the way the state is uh, treating its revenues and, and whether, whether it's collecting the revenues. And how does it decide that? Well, uh, we have legislatures who, uh, who make decisions about the budget and about taxes and so on. And how do they get in, into place? Well, people vote for them. Uh, so at the end of the day, this circles back around uh, to us, the people. And uh, part of our work in preserving Asian languages or preserving anything we value about the university or even education in the state. Uh, part of it has to do with our work uh, with the state government and legislatures and as voters to get them the message that we don't want these things to be cut, that we put a higher priority on them uh, and that, that the way the state has been going with respect to education is not the way the people would like to see it going. Uh, that, so that's one thing. Another way that, that we all can help this problem outside the university is community engagement. So we, we've heard something about the way the language programs help with community engagement uh, on, on that level. So engaging with the community. And part of what uh, equity and inclusion wants to do is promote more community engagement by this campus. Although I must say that the, the, the Berkeley students are among the more community engaged students uh, of any university in, in the country. I mean, the people who come here are predisposed to community engagement, and, that, and we're really proud of that, and we really want to um, foster that. 
Uh, but in these very difficult budget times, until the voters can get the right message to the state government, it's also important that we get community engagement in the sense that the community tries to help out with some of these, these cuts. So each community has its own interests, and I think you know this community has a particular interest in Asian languages. So I'm just here uh, to ask that part of the community energy that is, is bubbling up here goes towards asking, and well, how can the community help keep these programs going? Both from the point of view of ad advocacy, uh, but also even maybe some money. <laughs> we, don't, we don't turn that down. Uh, so th <laughs> so this, is, this, is a, you know, this does need to be a community effort. Uh, the administration needs to do its part in, uh, in moving the university forward. And, and taking account of the way the world is now. And the students are, are doing their part to bring this issue to the fore and make sure everybody uh, is aware of them and advocating for it. And the community needs to let its sentiments be known and also perhaps even contribute to the, uh, to the solution. So thank you very much. That's, that's our message. Actually, I'd like to um, thank uh, Elaine Kim and Gibor Basri, um, and uh, both to thank Elaine Kim for holding it down, seriously. I mean, it was so nice to hear what she had to say. And also um, to thank Gibor Basri for his support, and we really look forward to um, having a continuing advocate in, in, um, in Gibor Basri. And so um, we'd like to open this up to a few questions. So if anyone has any questions that you'd like to ask. Anything? Yeah, Sarah, what's up, Sarah? What's your question? <laughs> yeah, what would you like to? Hey, hi. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you both mentioned that it's very important that students are activists and that students engage in this um, kind of advocacy. So I was wondering, I mean, I know that last year there was a lot of like communication that was going on because of all the acti activism on campus, but um, in what ways um, does administration also initiate conversation with the students and with their needs? Well, that question has a, has a bunch of different answers. I mean, uh, speaking for myself, I, I have a number of advisory groups which have students on them. Uh, I actually spent about the, f the first year that I was in, in my office, as I said, it wasn't completely clear what it was I was supposed to do exactly. So I thought the best, best way to find out is to really ask everybody. Uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, in meetings with students and with, with faculty and, and staff uh, just small groups of people asking, you know, asking them what sort of vision they had uh, with this new position. Um, I, I, you know, I think there are, uh, there are a whole bunch actually of student um, interfaces with the administration with respect to various kinds of committees that students are on. The student governments, both the, the undergraduate and graduate uh, student governments have good conduits. I meet regularly with, with them as well, um, but interest groups or advocacy groups of various sorts have asked to meet with me and, and I try to you know, meet with everybody who wants to. Uh, my, in fact, my schedule you know, has gotten sufficiently uh, full that I'm not able to do that at the same rate that I was able to before, but, uh, which is unfortunate. But, but we also are looking at new forms of, of input. Uh, so so you know, there, are, there are online kinds of in, input that we aren't yet using. Uh, that we think we can use. We, we have to figure out how to do that in a, in a practical way. Uh, but I, I look forward actually to opening up some new channels where any student without an appointment can let me know, what, you know what's on their mind uh, and get input that way as well. 
I would think that this task force that you're planning to put together, that it's going to be one-third students, one-third community, and one-third faculty, could be very powerful um, means of articulating to the to uh, many aspects, many areas of the administration, um, the issues that uh, are being discussed here. So I think that's a really great idea and could be very effective. Any other questions? Any other questions? Um, well, you know, I would just also say, um, Gibor, you're mentioning that uh, the community has a role to play. And I think that this forum, I hope that it will go far toward um, instilling confidence in the community again um, in the university's commitment to safeguarding API language education. And so, um, in addition, like as you said, community sort of uh, advocacy and community funding isn't the entire picture. There has to be uh, some significant institutional demonstration of institutional will. So. Yeah, that's, that's really the main thing. Right, right. right. So, okay, well, thank you very much. Are we still waiting on Katie Joaquin to arrive? She's walking up the street, so Kyungjin, would you mind coming forward? Oh, you have to leave, too. Do you want to go right now? Okay, actually, I'm sorry, Kyungjin, do you mind? Professor Wong, Ling Chi Wong, um, actually has to leave as well. So we're, um, we're sort of playing with the, the, the sort of order, the order a little bit. I apologize. But um, so Sarah will introduce Professor Ling Chi Wong, um, who is our keynote speaker. And Okay. All right, so here is Lin Chi Wong. He is our keynote speaker of the day. Lin Chi Wong is a professor emeritus of Asian American Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. During the past 40 years, Professor Wong's impact as a Chinese American scholar, activist, institution builder at UC Berkeley, policy advocate, and public speaker has been unparalleled within the field of Asian American studies and in the nation. He has fought for the rights and for the voices of Asian Americans in politics and education, including bilingual education, emissions quotas, and US and China relations. In 1969, he also helped to establish a San Francisco-based advocacy group, Chinese for Affirmative Action, also known as CAA. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, API Education and Language Now for inviting me. You know, I'm not a teacher of Asian languages, but I am very passionate about language rights and education in our public schools and universities. And I'm also very passionate about Asian language and Asian studies policies and programs. So my presentation actually is based in part on my passion and experience in these areas. I also want to thank the students for protesting cuts in uh, Asian language classes last year, and more importantly, for raising hidden but important issues facing Asian language education in particular and Asian studies in general. I don't like to indulge in hyperboles, but I don't think it is an exaggeration to call the situation a crisis, if not a disgrace, as I shall demonstrate. I would like to raise these issues in the hope that this campus and colleges and universities across the nation will begin to address them by rethinking and restructuring their assumptions, perspectives, and approaches to Asian language education and Asian studies. Both fields, of course, are very much interrelated, although if you look at the way uh, you know, the knowledge is organized, they are really totally separated. And they're too important also uh, to, to the United States to be left adrift and ignored. Let me just try to cover several areas. First, take a look at the foundation and organization and curricula of liberal arts education. You know, this is very, as uh, Professor Elaine Kim pointed out earlier, you know, what we have is really fundamentally Eurocentric. We inherited the intellectual traditions of Western Europe from the Greco-Roman thoughts to the Judeo-Christian faith, from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, from the Revolution 
to empire building. Upon these Europe-centered worldview and traditions, backed by an enormous economic, political, and military power, we built our Eurocentric liberal arts education and institutions of higher education. In fact, we claim universality in our Eurocentric approach, and we routinely equate liberal arts education with the study of European civilization. For this reason, all non-European studies were seen as oriental and exotic and treated as uh, you know, non-essential, marginal, and expendable at best. This is where Asian language education and Asian studies in universities and colleges across the nation are in fact located. And this is also why we find our Eurocentric worldview and the state of liberal arts education anachronistic and not in line at all with the realities of the 21st century. So let me elaborate. In terms of organization of knowledge, let's take LNS on this campus. Now, if you look at your general catalog, you will find that it's divided into four divisions. Number one, mathematical and physical science, with five departments plus the College of Chemistry, which is considered the physical sciences. And then biological sciences, with seven uh, divisions. And then number three, the arts and humanities, which is, has the, by far the most number of departments, 18 departments and 13 programs. And then number four, the social science with 12 departments and 14 research units. Now, of course, we're interested primarily in humanities and social science here. In the humanities, only three departments, meaning East Asian language and culture, South Southeast Asian studies, and Near Eastern language, uh, stu Near Eastern studies, only three out of 18 departments uh, you know, are non-European and only Buddhist studies out of the 13 programs is non-European, the rest are all European. So from that, you can already see how Eurocentric the curriculum uh, in, our, in, our, in, in LNS is. And for the social science, uh, it is fair to say that the theoretical and methodological foundations of all the departments in social sciences are Eurocentric, largely based upon and emerge out of the study of European societies. Even if the, object, if, even if the objects of their inquiries were non-European. In other words, they would be studying China or Indonesia or Thai, but using European theor theories and methodologies to look at these societies. So they are also very Eurocentric in that sense. In other words, the assumptions and the perspectives are essentially Eurocentric. This is why in the scheme of knowledge and bureaucracy on this campus, Asian language education and Asian studies are overwhelmed or indeed drowned in a sea of Eurocentrism. It would be an understatement to say that there are serious knowledge divides and gaps in our current teaching and research and our distribution of budget, academic personnel and resources among the departments are unequal. Now let's take a closer look at the Asian language and uh, Asian studies in higher education. Given the intellectual and institutional background that I just outlined above, how do we look at Asian language education and Asian studies in higher education? A little history here will help understand our current problem. And actually, Professor Elaine Kim provided a lot of very excellent example that you know, sort of falls in line with this history, that I'm, so brief history that I'm going to suggest. First, Asian language education in higher education began first and foremost with a department called Oriental Languages or Oriental Studies with emphasis placed on ancient writings, philology, religions, and philosophy. Ancient, and I want to em emphasize ancient. And in the 19th century, it meant primarily the study of Egyptology and Assyriology in the Near East and Chinese in the Far East. Even the geographic names is very biased, looking at the world from London's point of view. So Near East, you know, for Egyptology and Assyriology. I used to be, by the way, in Assyriology, which is another word for study of uh, you know, Middle East uh, languages and literature, or Semitic languages and literature. Um, and then Far East, 
China and Japan and Korea uh, in the Far East. Of course, from, from our point of view here, it's really far west, right? <laughs> but it shows you how Eurocentric, you know, these from the linguistic evidence, how Eurocentric, uh, you know, whole curriculum has been. And of course, in Berkeley, we call the Near Eastern Studies. I used to be in that department as a graduate student. And we also used to call the East Asian Language Department Oriental Languages until some students about 20 years ago pointed out that the word oriental was really a very derogatory and racist word. So they petitioned the university to change the name to East Asian Languages. So again, you know, the student activism actually helped change some of the things that happened on this campus. So it was not until the early 20th century that Sanskrit, Hindi, Urdu, and Japanese were added, and then still later, Tibetan and Mongolian, and even later in the second half of the 20th century, Korean, Thai, and other uh, Asian languages. In other words, the emphasis in the Oriental Languages Department historically was always the study of mostly ancient and dead rather than modern and living languages, and emphasis placed mostly on, on the ancient, preferably exotic texts rather than spoken languages. Native language proficiency in speaking, reading, and writing has never been a requirement, sometimes not even a prerequisite for faculty teaching in Oriental Languages Department. That, I hope, comes as you, to you as a shock. But it is a reality throughout the, much of the history of that department on this campus. Now, this is why. Uh, in comparison with German, French, and Spanish department, there are really significant differences in the faculty language proficiency, curriculum, and pedagogy with the, you know, with the Asian uh, language department. Had we treated Asian languages the same way we treated European languages on this campus, we would not have the problems that we face today. And all you have to do is to just compare the three departments that I mentioned with the other, uh, the rest of the departments in the humanities unit. And moving on to Asian studies uh, in, uh, in so-called international and area studies. The serious studies of contemporary Asian societies, history, cultures, and politics, and economics began um, with only with the advent of the Cold War in the 1950s, okay? Everything prior to that, it's all about ancient texts, ancient languages, and philology, and religion, and, and philosophy. In other words, its importance was driven largely, the study of Asian studies and international area studies, was largely driven by political and ideological necessity during the Cold War, and of course, bankrolled mostly by the United States government, including CIA, and of course, corporate foundations. So it, it came to be known as the International and Area Studies, uh, with scholars trained in and dispersed in disciplines in various departments in social science. So International and Area Studies is all social science, and the scholars are dispersed among these departments. Now, to master the contemporary Asian languages, these scholars usually have to go to, the, to receive their language training, not in the Oriental Languages Department, because you don't get that, but you have to actually go through field studies abroad uh, in the target languages and areas. Because they are discipline bound, their teaching and research are confined mostly in their respective departments in social sciences. Very isolated. You know, if you study Chinese politics, so you're, okay, you're, you're in the political science department among dozens of fa faculty there, you're pretty much there by yourself. And if you're an anthropology studying Japan or Indonesia, you're in the anthropology department all by yourself out there. Collectively and in theory, their research falls in something called a group, the group in Asian studies. If you look up your catalog, that's what it's called. Uh, but in practice, however, there is little unity and universality 
in the knowledge of Asian studies, because scholars work mostly within their disciplines and disperse throughout the campus among the different departments. This arrangement makes it difficult to achieve co uh, curricular coherence and co collegiality among faculty in Asian studies. And of course, for those of you who are graduate students, you know that it is a nightmare uh, for those interested in Asian studies because you just you look at it and where do I go? Which department, which fa faculty, which discipline do I go into? And so this is, you know, again, you know, I'm talking about the legacy of uh, you know, LNS. Now let me say a few words about Asian language education in public schools. The cumulative result of the points that I just made above is the exclusion of Asian languages as foreign languages in public school curricula. In late 1980s, the office of the president of the University of California appointed me to head a system-wide task force on Asian languages. The primary objectives of that task force were to see if existing foreign language requirements for UC discriminated against Asian American applicants, and if Asian language education could be strengthened and expanded. And I worked from, in, as a chairman of that task force from 19, 1980s to until I retired three years ago. As the chair, I identified several obstacles. First, there was virtually no Asian language classes available in, el in the elementary and secondary levels in public education across the United States. Over 98% of foreign language classes in high schools were in French, German, or Spanish, with a few schools offering Hebrew, Italian, and other languages. Secondly, politically and economically important languages like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese were offered only in the so-called heritage schools in the Asian American communities, none of which, of course, were recognized as legitimate foreign languages and their credits not acceptable in any colleges or universities. Thirdly, there was a serious shortage of both teachers and curriculum material in all Asian languages. And lastly, the college board that provides the SAT achievement test in foreign languages refused to develop tests for Asian language proficiency on the ground that there was no demand for such tests. Because since 98% of them offer only French, German, and Spanish, so you know, college board can legitimately say that they, well, we don't need any Chinese, Japanese, Korean, or Vietnamese tests at all. So when you put all these things together, you get a total shutout of Asian languages. And Asian languages have no legitimacy and there's no access to learning the most widely used languages in the world today. It's quite amazing when you think about it. Now, as you can see, the exclusion was total and pervasive, up and down from elementary to the highest level of education. It could only be the result of Eurocentric focus in higher education and the narrow conceptions of what, constitute, what constitutes Asian uh, language education and Asian studies. Let me make one other point about the community language schools. In spite of their exclusion from universities and public schools, Asian language education has been around as long as there have been Asian American communities in the United States. For Chinese, since the gold rush, Japanese and Korean since the turn of the 19th century, for Punjabi since the early 20th century, and for Vietnamese since 1980s. These are languages used and taught in the Asian American communities. To many Asian Americans, these are their native tongues spoken in the United States. Continuous immigration from more and more Asian uh, countries to the United States has made Asian languages a rich and increasingly indispensable linguistic resource for the United States. Yet neither the public schools nor the universities have made systematic efforts to, re to receive and include them in their teaching and research. If our universities and colleges have tapped into these, these, linguistic, this linguistic goldmine, 
the United States would have become a leading global center for Asian language and Asian language education and Asian studies. So in conclusion, let me suggest that we need to rethink, restructure, and reorder our priorities in Asian language and uh, Asian education and Asian studies. After September 11, the United States government discovered how ill-prepared we were in understanding and dealing with Arab countries, and also in the last two decades, uh, in understanding and dealing with the rise of China. Our government, in fact, has now declared Arabic and Chinese as top priority languages, and I have been involved in a fast-track national project to put Arabic and Chinese teachers in all 50 states' public schools. Fast track. I mean, we're really trying very hard to do that. Uh, what, is, well, what a sad commentary on the state of our foreign language education. And what a shame that our colleges and universities have been so weighed down by the legacy of Eurocentrism and exclusionism. I strongly support the proposal to create that task force and to figure out how, what we must do uh, to bring Asian language education and Asian studies into the 20th century, 21st century. Thank you. Yeah. So I'd really like to thank Professor Ling Chi Wong. Um, you know, I just have to say that uh, last year when students were at the forefront of the struggle to protect and to safeguard um, API language education on this campus, we had very few faculty allies. Very few faculty members came out in support of us. And um, it was enormously heartening to be able to um, you know, speak with Professor Wong to hear what he had to say, to hear what Elaine Kim had to say, to speak with Colleen Lai and a handful of others who really had a very ethical, deeply courageous critique. And we thank you for that, yeah, really and truly. So, um, and they've been mentors to many of us um, in this room. So, um, what, so actually, let's just open this up for Q&A. Uh, and Ash, is Kyung Jin still here? Is Kyung Jin still here? Okay. All right, any questions? You guys, especially for the students who are here, you have an opportunity to ask a question of a true APA warrior, okay? <laughs> you seriously do, so questions. Yes, would you mind coming up? Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for speaking, and it's really great to hear someone say what you just said. That um, actually, recently I um, I ran into um, I don't know this Chinese American artist named Floyd Oi Wang, and um, I told her that I was an art history student and Chinese minor in Berkeley, and uh, she told me, "Oh, that's such that's you know you're." faculty is great, but they're very conservative because you don't have an Asian American um, art history program and we've tried to, you know, talk to them and, you know, they kind of refused and, I mean, part of it is, you know, budgeting and, like, even to get the professors teaching the, the Eurocentric, I guess, topics is really difficult, but in, it's exactly like what you say and it's really hard to get, um, I guess, more Asian or Asian American centered programs, or, or I mean classes or courses that aren't, um, I guess, very, I guess, an not ancient, but you know, pre like 19th century kind of topics. And, and I feel like there's, they're trying to, but I don't know what, what it is, whether it, there's not enough faculty or like people who specialize in um, those topics, or there's just, not really a need, or they don't feel like there's a need. But yeah, thank you. Yeah. So it thank does you. seem like there's a question there, right? Like, yeah, you know, it is a question, yeah, actually. Yeah. And I think the reason really is quite obvious. I think what uh, Professor Basri said earlier, the, the, the conservatism that's entrenched on this campus 
and the legacy of Eurocentrism makes it very difficult. The resistance is very strong, and the system, of course, is stacked against any kind of change. And so it's, uh, it will take a tremendous amount of effort. And I, I really think that uh, you know, we have a very important ally for institutional change here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was very inspired by what he had to say. And I think what we are talking about in this uh, symposium here, I think could very much be part of uh, what uh, Professor Basri and Vice Chancellor Basri uh, agenda could be. Uh, and I think we hope, I hope that uh, you know, we could work with you and to bring about the kind of changes that are really urgently needed. I mean, when I look at the curriculum, the faculty composition uh, in the LNS, you know, and I, you know, and I myself, you know, I love European civilization. I mean, <laughs> I do, and I was steeply, in, you know, trained in that area. You know, my undergraduate was in Western music, European music, and philosophy, and minor. And then my 10-year graduate education is all in Semitic languages and literature. And uh, so I, I consider myself very much a product of Western civilization. But I'm also, again, painfully aware of how the entire system is really stacked up against any kind of a new effort. Because it's just, a, you know, we have these departments that have virtually no students in them, and yet they're still there. And uh, you know, and what do you do about it? You know, and uh, and that's a real challenge for somebody like a vice chancellor who tries to bring change and equity to this campus. It's not. It's a quite a formidable job. Right. I think that that Lynchy has Lynchy has just made such a wonderful point, and it's that the way that this university sort of system is set up, it discourages change from happening easily. I mean, the status quo is sort of endlessly replicated. So the question that we have right now is, as a gathering of people who want to promote progressive change in the area of API language education, how do we bring our vision together with this institution to begin implementing it. I don't think that the budget crisis means that we have to put this off the table. In fact, I think the time is ripe to discuss this matter right now. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, Catherine, will you, will you, would you mind coming up here? Oh, OK, project. I can hear you. Yeah. You know, it will take a long time to talk about this, but I can tell you one thing, and this is really based on experience. You know, of, uh, you know, the only job I ever had was to teach here in the last 30, nearly 40 years on this campus. And I, since I, you know, came out of the graduate department here in the Near Eastern Studies department, by the way, um, you know, I, I know that the um, in order to make any change at all on this campus, we have to invest at least three to five years for any kind of change, based on my experience. And also based on a very important uh, wise advice that I heard from uh, you know, Chancellor, former Chancellor Bowker. Uh, Chancellor Bowker was on this campus in the 1970s at a time when this campus was really you know, in a turmoil, a lot of student protests. And he told in one of his senior staff meetings you know, with the chancellor's cabinet, he advised them that never underestimate the power of bureaucratic delays. <laughs> now, and, and that is a very sound advice. And uh, so to me, the antidote for this is of course persistence and resilience. Uh, that you just have to endure and set your eyes on the goal and work on it knowing that you got to have at least three to five years to make a dent on the institution. So I, th I took Bauker's advice very seriously. 
and try to work on it without being discouraged. And uh, you know, just so I think the task force idea is to come out with you know proposals, concrete proposals, so that we could make to the administration and to the academic senate. You know, it's a lot easier to deal with administration than with academic senate. Trust me, because I served on that body many times, including chair two committees, uh, and uh, it's very difficult. Now, a lot of time, you know, when I travel. People said that, you know, isn't it nice that you work in such a liberal, progressive uh, university like Berkeley? And I said, you know, you have a wrong impression about Berkeley. Uh, the reason why Berkeley has this worldwide reputation of being liberal and progressive and forward looking all the time is because of the student protests. You know, every time student protests, the, the newspaper all over the world reported it. And then the world gets the impression that, oh, Berkeley is really progressive. And I said, in fact, the opposite is true, that the faculty and the institutions are very, very conservative. And because of that conservatism, that it provoked the student to protest. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, Berkeley inherited this reputation of being very progressive and liberal. Thank you very much. I do have an appointment in San Francisco at 7 o'clock, so I must leave. Okay. But before he leaves, Ling Chi was the first member who agreed to come onto our task force. There are still spaces <laughs> available, but thanks, to, I mean, we are so lucky to have someone with his vision on that task force. Thank you so much. Okay, and just briefly, we, we originally had Kyung Jin Lee. She was here from the Korean Center, a community center of the East Bay. She had to leave. She is um, an immigration advocate. And she was going to, she had to leave. As with many people who work in the community, they have overlapping responsibilities. Um, but I believe that Katie Joaquin is here. Is that correct? OK. One thing that I can just tell you that Kyung Jin was going to speak about, she was going to speak about the kind of local work that is done within the local um, Korean American community and uh, the number of students who come out. Yes? She's not here? Oh, Kyung Jin is here? Oh, so if Kyung Jin and Katie Joaquin can come up, that would be great. Yeah. Kyung Jin, thank you so much for waiting. Okay, and as they are coming up, I'll provide you all with a short introduction for both of them. Kyung Jin Lee is an Immigration Services Director in Korean Community Center of East Bay. KCCEB was founded 24 years ago to empower the Korean American and other communities of the Bay Area through education, advocacy, service, and the development of community-based resources. KCCEB offers a wide range of services and community-sensitive programming, focusing on the creation of the vital building blocks for the future Korean American community. Um, the representative for Filipinos for Affirmative Action is Katie Joaquin. Wa um, FAA was established in 1973 in response to the growing influx of immigration immigrants from the Philippines and the discrimination and alienation they face as newcomers. Over the past 35 years, FAA has been an advocate for immigrant and civil rights for the Filipino community. Their mission is to build a strong and empowered Filipino community by organizing constituents, developing leaders, providing services, and advocating for policies that promote social and economic justice and equality. So come up. Thank you for coming and welcome. Um, I wanted to apologize. I actually am running late for my next appointment, so I gotta speak and run. So sorry about that in advance. Um, I am from the Korean Community Center of the East Bay, and I've had, um, in my work there, and previous to that, I've been working within the grassroots Korean community movement for over a decade. And in my experience, uh, I've had 
um, countless experience working with Cal students, undergrad students, Bolt Law students, um, serving as translators, interpreters, uh, community um, organizers, and, and just endless um, involvement within the grassroots community. So I can definitely attest to the importance and the, the vital importance of um, that the language programs at Berkeley provides to not just the students, but to the local community that it, they serve. Um, one anecdotal evidence that I have that attests to that very well is that I've been with, with, the, with KCCB for the last four and a half years. And as the immigration coordinator, I interface with monolingual Korean speakers every day. That's my job. And in, that, in, the, in the time that I've been there, I have uh, developed a very good working relationship with a family, family immigration attorney that works out of San Francisco. He's been volunteering with KCC for 15, almost 15 years now. And he actually got introduced to the organization through, uh, uh, while he was an undergraduate at, at Berkeley. Um, he was, um, what, what's the word? Encouraged um, to, well, he had a lab partner in his biology class who was also Korean. And he was enlightened or encouraged to um, enroll in a Korean class. This is a white Anglo man we're talking about. And uh, once he took not just one class, but a few classes in Korean, he traveled to Korea for about a year to get more in-depth language skills and to learn the culture. Once he came back to the United States, he uh, became a Bolt Law student and began volunteering with KCCB through his language uh, abilities. And he has been practicing now for over 10 years. Uh, he's very, very reliable. He's become a valued um, gem in my in my in the work that I, the daily work that I do. And it's a it's a direct byproduct of the Berkeley language classes and um, the the cultural diversity that this campus offers. Um, and not just in within my program, but. But definitely in my program, what, I, what I'm charged with doing is interfacing with a government agency like the Citizenship and Immigration Service. And my language skills, the language skills that I can acquire through volunteers from undergraduates in Cal and Bolt Law students um, has been definitely invaluable. Um, I recruit, I, I, de I heavily depend on you know, recruiting volunteers from this campus. Uh, because of the distance, because of the accessibility, and because of the quality uh, tra language training that the students have received through these programs. Um, and especially within talking more generally in the, in the community for the second and uh, the coming third generation Korean um, children of Korean immigrants that are going through the education system that, are, that have no direct connection to Korea uh, or you know, the cultures and the language. The, the language program here is um, absolutely critical to continue to instill the cultural pride, to continue to um, serve the diverse uh, cultural setting in this state. So thank you. Sorry, I gotta run. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't really work. Okay. Okay. So um, I wanted to ask people first to help me out so we could get a little bit of grounding for the brief um, intro I wanted to do to air work. And could you throw your um, fist up in the air if you're a student and you were trying to, <laughs> okay, yeah, if you're a student, period. But also if you're a student um, and if you had to look for, if you've been working or you've started looking for work either to help pay for your education or to help your family with some of their expenses, fist up. I see some, okay. Um, and then fist up in your air if you or someone you know has graduated and is having a really hard time finding work right now. That's almost everybody. And then um, lastly, if you could just put your fist up in the air if you know somebody who has either lost their job in the past year or is having a very difficult time looking for work, anybody at all. Okay, almost everybody in the room. So I started with that because I also wanted us to, um, you know, recognize how the struggle of the community and also of the students is rooted in the same flaws in our economy. Particularly in this period, I think it's important for us to examine um, air conditions as students um, within that context and also within the broader community. Um, 
And so that means that we need to work together in order to really address those problems as students and as community members. And um, I mean, what these cuts look like, I mean, it's not just losses in jobs in the economy, difficulty finding work. It's also critical cuts to services that people need. It's cuts to education, it's cuts to language, that's why we're here. But it's also cuts to really important benefits that people in the community rely upon, like Medi-Cal. Um, there's one, um, for example, at FAA, I'm the worker organizer, and so I work with airport workers and also caregivers in Union City, um, majority of which are recent Filipino immigrants. Um, and in this context, like people have been getting a lot of Medi-Cal notices to their door. One in particular, he's a 79-year-old OG, you know, airport worker organizer. His name's Monong Hector Archangel, and um, he has diabetes, and he constantly um, is having to go to the doctor. Um, he really relies on his Medi-Cal and his Medicare, but he received a notice last year saying that they weren't going to be able to provide him with the same services they've been providing him with, um, and so that leaves him in a really difficult position. And it's not just cuts to Medi-Cal; it's also cuts to other benefits. It's limitations on the amount of unemployment insurance people can receive, even though um, you know, um, these benefits exist. There's also difficulties, particularly with the population that we work with, in accessing them, because there's a lack of cultural competency as well in the staff that are in these departments and in these agencies. And that's also one critical piece. You know, we need all you students that are learning these languages to be in those positions, because it's also a really difficult process to navigate applying for these different benefits. Um, even though um, Filipinos are the second largest immigrant population in California and in the US, second largest immigrant population. Um, because in the Philippines, uh, many of them are trained um, in speaking some English. There's not as much um, staff um, that, is, that are in these positions that are able to help them access benefits. Um, but that was kind of a bleak picture. <laughs> There's also a lot we can do together, right? So what can we do? Um, one part is forums like this, um, educating ourselves on the importance and what we can do to keep our language programs in place and also um, organizing together, um, right? And so what does that look like? Um, I wanna start with the language classes. When you are in language classes, how many students here are taking a language class right now? So you learn the basics, right? You learn grammar, you learn words, but you also learn about the culture of the language that you're studying, right? And then when we're actually practicing language in society right now or in this context, it's kind of like, um, we also need to learn the culture of the people here that speak that language, the different conditions that they're facing. Um, and so the different worker working conditions, the different struggles they face. Um, and part of that is documenting those kinds of stories. And um, I think what we know from history is that youth in general and students in particular have always been at the forefront um, to establish ethnic studies, to establish language studies within universities, but then also in civil rights in general. And so we really need young people in leadership um, and that's kind of the critical point uh, for a lot of you students in the room and also professors that are trying to bridge the gap between what we're doing in the universities and what's going on in the communities is that one way that we can work together, one way that we can learn about the culture of the people that speak the languages here is to actually go out in the community and volunteer at some of the community organizations. Um, some of the things that FAA is doing right now, I'll speak particularly to the worker organizing program. Um, we go out, um, we've been um, just starting our caregiver organizing project. You know, the home care industry is maybe one of the only industries that, haven't has, that hasn't had such loss in work because it's so necessary. I mean, everybody went crazy right after <laughs> the World War II and the baby boomers are now in their elderly in their golden years and a lot of people are needing care. <laughs> so there's a lot of people born right at that time and now they're, they're aging. Um, and that's an industry that's constantly growing and that's where we identified um, we would like to do our work because a lot of there's a growing number of Filipino immigrants that are coming here, particularly to work in the health sector. And so one way that we do that is we go out to the community, we knock at different group homes and facilities, and we just meet the people and say, so what's up, you know, like, so how's your work here? What are some of your working conditions? What do you think needs to change? And we document those stories. And I want um, Mary June, if you could throw your hand up so people could see her. Mary June interned with us this past summer and she was so critical because she also speaks the language. Um, and a lot of these workers, they're a lot more comfortable speaking Tagalog or it, they're monolingual Tagalog speakers. And so that's really critical for us to support these people but also to learn about you know, what the conditions our communities are facing here. And she would document 
She would go door to door to the different group homes with us. And you know, sometimes people were like, who are you? What are you doing? Most of the time, they'll let you come inside and you, you, know, you do a survey. And it's, it allows us to build our analysis and to kind of guide the direction of our organizing. But then she would also write these stories, um, stories about their migration from the Philippines, um, stories about how they came to work in this particular group home here, and about what are some of the problems they face, what do we need to do. Um, and I just list that as one example of the things that we do. I mean, we also provide a lot of education, um, workers' rights training, um, and then we organize to improve working conditions, to you know, fight budget cuts, those kinds of things. And ultimately, I think that's at the root of what a lot of us are trying to do. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I, I guess I just, I'll stop there, um, and just to say that, you know, the work that all of you doing here is really critical, and that I think together, um, students, community members, and also, are there any professors that are in the room, language professors? Dang, oh, there's some, hey. <laughs> um, you know, working together a little bit to, you know, funnel our resources and, and let students, like, learn both in the classrooms as well as in the communities that they're living in or that they're surrounded by. That's it. Oh, sorry, I also wanted to say that I did bring some um, Filipinos for Affirmative Action uh, newsletters, so I don't have a whole lot of them, but if people are really interested, they're up here. And then if anyone wants to volunteer, I'm just going to give my phone number at the office, and we would love for you to volunteer if this sounds interesting to you and you want to help out in the community. Um, my number is 510-465, no one's writing it down, but <laughs> 9876, extension 301. I also have these, bro these newsletters that I'm going to leave on the table in the back.